I love Gates's powerful 2013 piece, Red Line with Black Soot and Enthusiasm. It's in this, it's this red one over here. Um, it's a beautiful vertical composition of fire hoses made possible by Gates and by an iterability intrinsic to the materials. The hoses, I guess they're rubber or canvas, I'm not sure, black soot and enthusiasm are here shown to be not fixed substances, but units of process, something like what the philosopher Whitehead called concrescences of a flow. Like the restless fire that evidently called all of these things into being, the red lines, the black soot, and the enthusiasm tend to become otherwise than they are. They have a propensity to splay out and multiply in form. This is perhaps most obvious with the enthusiasm of the piece title. It's the enthusiasm of the water spewing out under pressure in the hoses. It's the enthusiasm of volunteers wielding hoses to save lives. It's the enthusiasm of the Birmingham men in 1963 who tried to extinguish the flesh of civil rights marchers. I'm not sure all of them were enthusiastic, but. It is also the enthusiasm of the artist assembling these materials with his memories of civil rights and invoking ours, and the enthusiasm of the artwork's audience. Finally, let us not forget the enthusiasm of the colors red and black with their own sort of conatus or drive to persist in being. Red line with black soot and enthusiasm gives nod to the force of all these vitalities, the morally good ones, the cruel ones, the amoral ones, both human and non-human, and I marvel at the way the piece is able to display the tense coexistence of them all. And its beauty is not, I think, incidental to its ability to pull this off. In Venice in 2013, red line with black soot and enthusiasm hung on a wall as part of a larger composition of objects and moods. There it collaborated with a wooden cart and white pottery, polished concrete floor of the gallery with the bodies of the visitors to the installation called Prima Materia at Punta della Dogana. Red line with black soot and enthusiasm not only radiates the compressed vitality, I thought, of the materials and their historical mo memories, but it also highlights its own composite nature. It presents itself as an assemblage. I use the term to refer to a grouping of vibrant materials, a living, throbbing confederation that has functionality through its heterogeneity, or uh, heterophonia, a word I just learned from Richard Harper. Assemblages are not governed by any central head. No one element has sufficient competence to determine consistently the trajectory of the whole group, although resistant knots of force can and do develop. The Dorchester Projects is an even more complex assemblage than red line with black soot and enthusiasm. It includes wooden planks, gospel music, stairs, pottery, ebony magazines, coffee, Dorchester Street, a Hugo Boss trench coat, enthusiasm and belief, and maybe in the near future taxi cabs, because one of my favorite quotes I read from Theaster Gates, I haven't met, met you yet, um, is, I don't want to start a cab company, but, if I w but I will if I have to. <laughs> okay, social betterment. How best to characterize the work performed by the Dorchester Projects, the agency of that assemblage? It's aesthetic, it's political, and when I tried to name it more precisely, this old-fashioned phrase popped into my head, social betterment. And Tracy Ann Williams had her doubts about bettering, but I think this is a different kind of social betterment. I feel I'm in the presence of, an, of a work that tries with a do-it-yourself earnestness to make things better, to turn swords into plowshares, to make the, for example, to make the racist fire hoses of Bull Connor into a talisman of vibrant black culture in the piece. Um, a red line, black soot, and enthusiasm, um, to render vacant buildings into lively workshops. It's art as, quote, urban renewal, if you divest that idea from policy discourses of the last several decades, to mean simply the refreshment and reactivation of urban places, landscapes, and lives. And as I was thinking about how, what I would title this little talk, I just thought of it's art as refreshment. Um, in 1934, Ernest Wilkins, president of Oberlin College and a devotee of John Dewey, um, gave a speech on the theme of social betterment through art. So I read it, popped up on the Google, um, and Wilkins offers an eclectic and inclusive definition of art as any effort, quote, with purpose and with plan to achieve the production of beauty, end quote. 
Wilkins, like Gates, doesn't exclude commercial endeavors from the realm of art. They too can, quote, form a betterment assemblage, that's my word, with, and again now this is Wilkins, woodworking, the drama, the cinema, the dance, reading aloud, ceramics, metalworks, printing and binding of books, furniture, the making, the keeping of the home, gardening, city planning, and the preparation of exhibitions. But what does a better society look like? Wilkins is not shy about stating his vision because it's 1934. It would, one, he's got six, six things, maintain the physical and mental health of its inhabitants, the good society would offer ample opportunity to learn at all ages, provide the opportunity to earn enough and with satisfaction in the work itself, it would seek equality in economic status, it would use participatory decision making to ensure the common welfare and security from crime and justice, violence and war, and finally it would provide plenty of time for the pursuits of leisure, including philosophy and religion, where the latter is conceived this way, quote, the cooperative consciousness of the interrelations of all life and of the creative spirit which moves through all life, together with the activities which follow from some such consciousness, end quote. That's religion. Now, would Gates embrace all of these claims or express the ideals in the same way? Would he find the list sufficient? We will maybe soon find out. Um, I don't know. But I cite Wilkins because I think he shares with Gates and, uh, a certain earnestness about what he believes in, including the capacity of art to materialize beliefs and the efficacy of beliefs once they join forces with the materials of what I've been calling an assemblage um, um, to, 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 um, uh, to, to change society. Okay, um, I want to sort of just end by talking about responding to a question, and I'm getting to belief at the very end, is art a weak force? For Wilkins and I think Gates, and for me, um, art is powerful enough to make a political difference even in the face of entrenched powers like racism and a system run by and for the 1%. But others on the left are more dubious. To Jody Dean, a fellow political theorist, I'm a political theorist, um, uh, for example, injustice is so structurally embedded that the only way out is to fight fire with fire, to fight one giant abstraction called capitalism with another called communism. The ruthlessness of the former will meet its match only in the singular militancy of the latter. Um, Dean's new book uh, is sort of Lenin and Zizek inspired. It's called The Communist Horizon. It calls for the left's return to a class antagonism model of politics and the discipline of a revolutionary party. She's critical of activists and theorists who, quote, treat aesthetic objects and creative works as displaying a polit political potentiality that is missing from classes, parties, and union-based politics. To believe in the transformative power of art is to disconnect politics from the organized struggle of working people, end quote. Audiences and their audiences, she says, thus can feel radical without having to get their hands dirty. So Dean views art as a weak force, too weak to produce truly countercultural effects. She thus repeats an old story wherein the creative is pitted against the effective. The more aesthetically interesting an act or object, the less likely it is to be sort of good in a fight. The same antipathy is said to be at work within human temperament. The more sensitive and subtle the personality, the more artistic, the less likely it is to be courageous and strategic. Um, Hegel's famous version of this story, which I'm teaching just this semester, is the tale of the beautiful soul. The beautiful soul sympathizes deeply with pure ideals, with, we could say, the call of social betterment. But this soul's dissident delicacy recoils from any attempt to enact such ideals lest they become compromised. In Hegel's words, the beautiful soul lacks the power to externalize itself, the power to make itself into a thing, and thus to endure being. It lives in dread of besmirching the splendor of its inner being by action. Uh, in order to preserve the purity of its heart, it flees from contact with the actual world, end quote. And Adorno had a version of this. He says, the beautiful soul is spellbound, suspended between involuntary ataraxy, the aesthetic life due to weakness, and the bestiality of the involved, end quote. But of course, it's not true that taste for the beautiful cannot co cooperate with political courage in sooty streets. There are many, many examples of the conjoinment of romantic temperaments and political bravery and of artworks that refresh and produce powerful societal effects, indeed produce them by virtue of a refreshment that animates and motivates brave action. I give a, a list. There's 
poetry of Walt Whitman that dilated 19th century norms of gender and kinship and race. The new left was spurred on by the likes of Emma Goldman, the situationist, Herbert Marcuse, and Martin Luther King, to name just some examples of how romantic sensibilities and strong projects of social justice, urban vitality, and sustainable economies have entered into productive affiliation. Cornell West chronicles the political labor performed by the blues, and there's no reason to reject and advance the possibility that Gates' listening room might not also harbor some of that power. Dean's problem, that Jody Dean's problem, I think, at least in part, is that she considers a work of art in isolation, not as an element of a larger assemblage. Together, the idealistic, the beautiful, and the pragmatic have strong force, not weak force. But it's precisely Gates' pragmatism that others find wanting. Marina Vishmit, in her recent Eflux piece, which was in the, the group that um, Ka uh, Karen put together on the website, um, rejects pragmatism as weak. Instead of revolution, it seeks merely to do good in the here and now, that's a quote, within a horizon where there can only be addition, only accumulation, never disruption, end quote. Gates's DYI-ism is said to be blind to the fact that the same logic drives both its remedial attempts and the exploitative capitalism that generates the harm. Vishmet here makes explicit the social ontology that also underpins Dean's view of art as a weak force. They see a world governed by a, quote, logic structurally grounded in the economic mechanisms that drive capitalist theory, end quote. But is there really a single logic govern, con governing contemporary life? What if what we face is a world of multiple tendencies, some very strong, but not all of them operating in the same direction? A logic has a precision and an internal consistency or systematicity that a tendency does not. A logic has a telos. A tendency has something more like a more indeterminate trajectory. A logic must be singular. A tendency can be one of many. A logic can be surveyed from the outside. A tendency has to be inhabited in order to be understood. A logic is pure. A tendency is messy. So, if only the world was so neat and pliable as to allow itself to be channeled into a logic, then it would be so clear just what needed to be done. There's a longing for purity in Dean and Vishmit, I think, for a strategy of justice that's unpolluted by the very bodies, ideas, and tools of an unjust system. So maybe they're the ones who are the beautiful souls. And while they sound quite certain about what must be done, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't seem like they're actually doing anything for every domain of actual action falls into the trap of pragmatism. Okay, Baltimore's Believe campaign. About 10 years ago, signs with the single word Believe started appearing around Baltimore. On fire, I'm from Baltimore. On firehouses, high schools, parking garages, bumper stickers, which eventually morphed in typical Baltimore fashion to read things like Believe, hun, or Behave, or Be Leaf, or, you know, L E A F, or my favorite one is Beehive. Um, the idea behind the Believe campaign was, in the words of then Mayor Martin O'Malley, to tacky, tackle the city's drug violence by, quote, awakening Baltimore's truer sense of self, to tap the fire inside to confront the violence of drugs and drug addiction. The campaign sought to encourage drug, people who are drug addicted to seek treatment and more generally to lift the morale of Baltimore citizens, and it tied the slogan to neighborhood initiatives such as the one that raised funds to buy vacant, vacant buildings in the city. Gates and others in Baltimore have some excellent ideas about what could be done with those buildings. What the Dorchester Project shows is that positive belief in the power of art, in the possibility of social refreshment and beauty, can be a powerful agent for change when it enters into larger and more complex assemblages. Their beliefs can circulate and morph. They become non-individualistic moods, infectious collective atmospheres. In other words, they can alter the horizon, a horizon whose fate, capitalism, however voracious, does not fully determine. So Dean and Schmidt seem to accept the image of public culture given to us by the mainstream media. There it consists exclusively in a bunch of series, uh, circus acts, horse races called elections, stupefying spectacles of violence and fantasies of revenge, barkers maniacally hawking trinkets, all of, all of that punctuated by the arrival of clowns and animal tricks. But Gates and others, working DYI, small scale, and pragmatically, show us that a lot more is going on in public culture. So that's what I really like about the work.
good morning. I guess it's morning still. Um, my, my reflections are going to be somewhat more personal. Um, and it's not just because the Astor Gates is alive in the room, but because his work and this project in which a group of us have been trying to engage with it has been making claims on me that I've been trying to articulate and figure out whether I want to or can respond to. So um, a few words. I, I wonder whether it's a new school thing to reject the titles of panels, because all the people on the last panel are new school people and said, I don't know about migration. And uh, I have to say, but I say this in my capacity as a religious studies scholar, that spirituality and belief are two of the words I like least. But I have a spiel about that, and I was going to present it to you. But thinking about presenting that spiel in connection with the work of Theaster, especially Dorchester projects, has sort of caught me at mid-step. And I realized that from the engagement with his work, I have come to question some of my platitudes about the superficiality of thinking about, super, did I say superstition? Uh, <laughs> spirituality and belief. Um, and also there is a kind of hope that is raised by his work, a recuperative hope. Um, Shannon Jackson, as she set up our discussions this morning, used the phrase rebooting and reconnecting. Um, as I was putting together my remarks for today, it occurred to me that there are things that I have learn from the attempt to understand the claim and see if I can and want to respond to the challenge of Theastra's work that are taking me deeper into my understanding of the potential of these terms, um, perhaps to be used for good. So um, spirituality is a word that has a wonderful pedigree. It's a big, beautiful, wonderful, traditional word. But when I hear it today, it sounds to me like the beginning of the phrase spiritual but not religious often abbreviated SBNR. A lot of scholars of religion <laughs> say that SBNR is the newest religion. We used to think that atheists were the newest, but I mean, atheism takes too much work or certainty or something, and this is the old spiel. I'm going to correct it. Um, but SBNR um, is something which has always bothered me because it seemed to me that it was simply supposing you could be spiritual without engaging with the trouble of religion, without really engaging with the structure the challenge of it, its complexity, the legacies of it, um, the ways in which our own ways of understanding ourselves, the world, the cosmos, responsibilities to others are themselves already inflected in various ways specific to the particular religious traditions into which we tap. So my sense was, and continues largely to be, <coughs> that the SBNR phenomenon simply takes all the things we don't want to think about and say, that's what religion is. I don't do that. I'm too smart for that. I'm too deep for that. I'm too quick for that. And so it leaves all these things behind, and then all the things that we in the study of religion work on get left behind, right? So maybe this is just professional anxiety on my part mm -hmm. as well. Um, but among the sorts of things that people who are SBNR call R, um, about 15 years ago that wasn't SBNR, it was like organized religion that people disapproved of. They said, I'm religious, but I don't like organized religion. And it wasn't even that they liked disorganized religion, it was something else. So now we've moved to SBNR, so we're not even thinking about disorganized religion. But the things we've left behind are um, structure, definitions, authorities, hierarchies, more or less bounded communities, communities of accountability, fixed liturgies, a closed canon of scripture, the possibility of being wrong. The possibility of coming up to you and saying, no, you know, you didn't get that. You're not understanding this. Try again. Um, so I'm suspicious, um, and I take this from Karl Popper, I guess, about any kind of a tradition that you can't get wrong. And there's something, I think, about the language of spirituality in contemporary American culture that you can't get wrong. And I wonder what you can do with something that you can't get wrong. So my sense instead is that you can't really get and keep the spirit without the letter, with some letters. You need to have something um, that the spirit can play off of, something that may kill the spirit but may structure it. And Richard Harper mentioned spirit without life is formless in his comments this morning. It's a similar kind of thing, but there again I'm caught in mid-step because life sounds much more interesting than structure, hierarchy, <laughs> canons, liturgies, communities of accountability, and so on. I won't go as far as some of my friends who proudly claim to be RBNS, that is religious but not spiritual. Um, <laughs> although I think there's something interesting in that, and that might be the, the next interesting movement. There's, there's it's a whole other topic, but um, 
but engaging with these questions, which I rehearse often with colleagues and friends and students, um, in the context of Theaster's work, and specifically with Dorchester Project, I should say, like, like, like some of the other members of this panel, um, Theaster's work was new to me when we went to Chicago. So my first experience of his work was sleeping on the floor of Black Cinema House. So I feel in some way that I have this strange, almost unconscious relationship with the work that I'm, it's a dream I'm trying to remember and can't <laughs> quite remember, and then afterwards trying to recreate what that dream must have been. Um, but in any case, my experience of Theaster's work is a, a space that I came into and tried to understand and that tried to, tried to understand what it was doing. Um, and it reminds me in this connection of the fact that one of the things that people do who care about the spirit or the spirits or spirituality, and you can use those terms if you'd like to, uh, the powers, life, whatever else it is, is to build spaces for them. And uh, Jasmine used the interesting phrase of not building but opening. Um, so I think that there's a vocabulary we can explore about things that, you know, containers, wrong word, spaces, opportunities, openings, being a good neighbor, or something for the spirit um, that maybe are not the religion part of spiritual but not religious, but something about some kind of a commitment to something. If you build it, they will come. The challenge, of course, is that the spirit um, will where it listeth, it goes where it wants to like the wind, and that's the spirit that people want to engage. So how do you engage something that isn't going to go where you want it to go? And I think that many of the spiritual, sorry, the religious spaces um, across traditions are designed in some way to try and facilitate that unpredictability. Then other people come in, misunderstand them, think that they're actually trying to constrain it. And to some extent, once people don't believe in those spaces anymore, they don't work, right? So um, spirituality isn't a term that I'm comfortable with, but thinking about spirituality and religion, or the spiritual but not religious, or the spaces or the openings in which spirit might be allowed to happen is something that Theaster's work has helped me work through. There's the spirit. I'll move on to belief. Belief is another trigger word for me. Um, people outside of religious studies, outside of religious traditions, I should say, tend to think about religion as something like a system of beliefs or a belief system or a system of beliefs and practices. And part of what I think commendably drives people to run into the SBNR direction is that they know that that's just not the way it works. People are not systematic, not in the ways that systems of beliefs are, at any rate. And the desire to be or the desire for other people to be is one that I think it's quite an appropriate thing to run away from. More deeply, the stuff of religion is not very well characterized by the language of belief, which is very cognitive, it's very passive in some way. Um, and that term has in recent centuries, within the English language at least, come to mean the more or less irrational assent to a statement assumed to be unverifiable and probably false. Um, the scholar Wilfred Cantwell Smith, um, a Canadian scholar of Islam, um, who helped sort of establish the, um, the study of religion in, on the east coast of the United States, Chicago is the true center of that, as you may know, um, wrote a very interesting series of books about the history of the concept of belief in English and how it is that it has moved from being something that is an opening to something that is standing outside of something and giving assent or not. The movement from a relationship, an opening, an exploration, a journey, a vulnerability, a risking, to something that instead assumes the position of the judge, who is fully competent to either approve of or disapprove of various candidates for conviction. So he reminded us, Wilfred Campbell Smith did, that the original meaning of belief in English had to do not with cognitive assent, but with commitment, and had to do with the heart and with the will. Um, Religion is not a head thing, but a whole body thing, and you don't get such soul as there might be except through the body. The leaf of belief, and I wonder if that showed up in one of the responses to the, uh, the Baltimore Belief Campaign, the L-I-E-F of belief um, is etymologically connected to the L-O-V-E of love, so it has to do with loving, beloving, rather than some intellectual thing. And as recently as the 17th century, it believe meant to entrust one's heart to someone to give one's heart to someone, usually to a person. So it's really the commitment to a relationship, um, an opening of oneself to a relationship of some kind. You find if you see belief in Shakespeare, it's never about the cognitive and we misunderstand it if we think that it does. So the language of belief is having to do with love, as having to do with commitment with the will rather than the mind. 
and the will is moving myself, not just sort of sitting there and observing the way the world is, is one that does survive in one interesting phrase in English. And that is the phrase, I believe in you. I believe in you is a very complicated speech act if you try to interpret what's going on and try to understand what's in it. It doesn't take a pragmatist, here I'm thinking about William James, but it doesn't take a pragmatist to see this as an utterance that tries to affect what it describes. That is to make real or make more real the reality it claims already to know is real. There's something about the utterance, I believe in you, that makes it's going to change you in ways that might justify my believing in you, but you haven't yet done those things, right? So, I mean, I believe in you arises in contexts in which somebody may be uncertain whether, in fact, they are capable of something, whether, in fact, there's enough there, whether they have the resources, the vision, the energy to do something, and in some sense, there's a transfer of resources and energy and vision when I say to someone, I believe in you. At the same time, I get constructed by the, art of, by, by the articulation, I believe in you. That there's a, a commitment or some kind of a relationship that I make to someone when I say I believe in you. Same thing with the community, not just an individual. I believe in you that, that it, it involves me as well. It's not just a little gift. It's not like a little check which is like, yeah, you exist. I believe in you. I know you're there. You're not dead. Um, um, but then, in fact, there's a whole deep tradition of thinking about belief as involving act, commitment, relationship um, that's very creative. And it's an opening. It's not just an opening, but a filling. It's almost like an opening that's a vacuum that's likely to draw something in. Um, I think there's more life yet in the word belief than there is in spirituality, and I suspect from the conversations that we've had so far already as a group with the Esther that he has much the same view. In our previous conversations, he spoke often and in exciting and innovative ways about belief. It was striking to many of us during our visit in Chicago how often the language of belief came up in many forms, and I should say they're all versions of the I believe in you concept of belief. None of them in the like, you know, do you exist? Is this real? Is this true? Is twice two really four kind of sense. At one point, he used a phrase that sort of stayed with me ever since, which is the belief muscle. <laughs> And I have to say, that's changed my thinking about all sorts of things. To think about belief as something that's a muscle, that's something that might be actually part of our equipment as, as beings, something that could, be, that could atrophy, something that could be exercised. A sense even that exercising it will make you better at using it the next time. That in that sense, belief isn't even a specific commitment, a specific giving of your heart and will to a particular person or cause or community or object or material, um, but it's... It's a practice, it's a way of living, it's a way of being. Um, at one point, so and this got me thinking about the value of believing itself. This also makes me think about E.M. Forster who wrote a famous essay in Two Chairs for Democracy called I Do Not Believe in Belief. <laughs> um, so I'm still working this out. <laughs> whether I believe in belief or whether my reluctance to believe in belief is actually a, uh, an emblem of privilege. Can you say, I hope, at some point in our discussions today, I'd like to hear more from Theaster about believing as an embodied and social practice um, and about I believe in you as something that constitutes both a self and a relationship. Um, and one thing that's come through from a number of the comments people have made so far is that Theaster does remarkable work with materials and he also does remarkable work with people. Um, and I think he believes in, I think there's a sense in which we can use this language of I believe in you with all of its older resonances of an older, more complicated kind of practice in thinking both about a way of relating to people, and to, including the dead, and a way of relating to actants of other kinds, more broadly to use a, a term we've learned from Jane. Um, I believe in you from the perspective of the actor as well as the recipient. Do I have time for one more reflection? So um, that's, I think I've convinced myself through talking about this that in fact spirituality and belief are useful categories after all. So thank you very much. <laughs> you, have, you, have, you have given me something that I thought I didn't need. And there it was right next to me. I had thrown it out myself. Um, the other point is something else that, that, that came up in an earlier discussion and that has to do with um, the very rich and interesting way in which your body of work engages a number of different religious traditions. And one of those traditions is Buddhism. And Buddhism, 
um, I've been thinking since we first had the visit and the first conversation, it's helping me think about what happens when you believe in something so much that you actually take it from the end of one career or one existence or one life and form and believe it into some other one. And Buddhism, as many of you may know, um, is a great world tradition that's always been bedeviled by the charge that it's based on a confusion. And that confusion is that the thing that you need to know more than anything else is that, you know, that there is rebirth, but the other thing that you need to know before that is that there is no self. So everybody who hears about this for the first time says, well, what gets reborn then? Is there a self or isn't there? If there's no self, what can be reborn? And um, as you may know from the, the etymology of the word nirvana is the snuffing out of a, an oil candle when the oil runs out. That's, that's, that's how it ends. There's no continuity in a flame. If you imagine a flame, um, the flame has no enduring selfness all the way through. It burns in the same place from different fuel at each point until the fuel runs out. So there's a very different conception of continuity um, that is a very different, leads to a very different conception of identity. Or maybe it's an undermining of the category of identity. And I found going back to those debates and that understanding about why it is in fact not a confusion, but in fact the mystery of persistence in being or of existing or being, being here now, um, in this idea of rebirth without self, a kind of a continuity that doesn't presuppose identity, and yet there is a continuity, there's a very deep continuity of some kind, it's a mystery, um, which softens our understanding of the meaning of identity, um, not just as an individual, but also as a member of a particular species. Um, not just as a member of a particular species of animals. Um, some Japanese traditions, which your work has invoked in some cases, think that plants and grasses and trees as well are things that we might find ourselves in this way, um, believed into being in some other way. Um, and finally, of course, it doesn't stop there. Rocks, stones, and others are also part of a continuum which we participate in various ways. So Theastra's work um, has resonated in very deep ways with my thinking, both about sort of the personal project of belief, of being a self, of living in time, um, of relating to inheritances and having to make up ones of one's own, um, to the eclectic um, practice that a, a number of us in religious studies call now lived religion, uh, which is that we misunderstand religion if we think that it comes from central authorities and in fact we should see the way in which it is made on the ground. And on the ground we'll find that people are much more eclectic, that they take what they need where they can find it and they make whatever else they need in various ways and that this is not the exception. This is not what happens um, in the shadows around the brightly lit parts of religion but that in fact this is the true energy that drives religion in the first place. It's the thing that maintains its centers. Um, Theaster Gates' work, as I've reflected on it, is a very powerful um, exemplification of some of those things that the lived religion movement focuses on, at the same time that it suggests that one thing that those of us thinking about those things might do is look more deeply at Buddhist conceptions of continuity and rebirth. So, thank you. Uh, hello. Ten to the good afternoon. Um, I'm Alexandra Wagner, and I teach sociology uh, in the School of Undergraduate Studies. Um, I was also one of the um, lucky ones uh, who went uh, this February to Chicago, and that was my first visit in ten years, or my second in my entire life. First time I spent entire three days just sitting in Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute. So this was a very radically different visit, and I'm thankful. I'm going to take Buddha's hand and tell you just a little moment um, that marked for me a visit to Chicago in an interesting way, and I consider it for me to be an opening to the work of the Esther Gates. And that is, we were uh, in a particular space of the experimental station, um, spending time talking what is that really brings us here and looking around to try to understand what was the spirit, what was the nature of a particular communal and artistic project that is not of this time. 
And we had plenty of time to see the space in quite a bit of detail. Uh, but it was at some moment that Mark said, oh, have you spotted Buddha? Have you spotted Buddha? No, I have not spotted Buddha. Rather large, rather visible Buddha inscribed on one of the walls of the space. Not spotting Buddha or anything that big may remind you that we come to each space with very limited abilities to see and that there is something about my inability to see Buddha which speaks about my preparedness to see something and definitely not something else. So uh, what does this have to do with what I consider to be some kind of understanding of Dorchester Project? Uh, I would say it has to do with a very particular kind of intelligence that the Aster Gates possesses, uh, which is uh, presented as telling the story in as many possible ways as possible. That is, there is something about uh, his narratives his communication with the world that is tactile. There is yet another that is auditive. There is yet another that is visual. There is something that is olfactory. There is something one can listen to. There is something one can sing. There is something one can eat. Eventually, <laughs> the story will be gotten in some way or maybe another. Uh, when we came to um, the first house, uh, Theaster gave us uh, a little introduction to his work. And uh, one of the things he said with, uh, quite specifically, um, and this will be only a paraphrase, is that each era, each moment, has its own uh, way of channeling affect. And different way in which uh, our worries uh, are engaged. I never understood really who in Chicago made the um, uh, list of places we would, we would visit, but we did visit Hull House, we did visit an experimental station, and then we did visit Dorchester Project. Three uh, possibilities of communication with the world that are located in very different historical periods where doing something for oneself or doing something for others had very different kind of articulation. Um, I would say that I absolutely join Jasmine and everyone who would critique the community narrative as the only one because it seems to me that in fact um, uh, Gates must, must be closer to the position that it is liberal who maybe knows what's good for others, while the radical starts by knowing what is good for himself. And I think that a lot of practice of, of Gates, as I have experienced it, really resides there. Not a selfish me made of a selfish gene, but a, a kind of understanding of what is really good for one's own uh, self. Uh, the question was asked before whether um, uh, our experiences with uh, Theaster Gates, with Orchester Project, uh, have anything to do or have come to impact the work we do now, or maybe classes we teach. And um, I was uh, trying, in thinking um, about this day, to, to say, well, where is really the location? Uh, where would I put uh, thinking about Dorchester Project to have most relevance, say, in terms of classes that I teach this semester? One is called Identity and Social Theory. Well, surely there would be a possibility for a session there, even though I don't know exactly what that session would spell. Another, a sociology of forgiveness. Yeah, there might be some 
vocabulary there, but I already know the man would hate it. In fact, uh, he quite, um, that is the Esther, uh, gave us quite an elaboration on his understanding of, for example, one salient possible word that is redemption. And his communication with redemption was uh, not here to, to redeem anything, just to make things present again, to make things present again. So I'd say that maybe the, the, the class, the situation, which uh, offers some possibilities for, for talking, and has also something to do with the issue of belief, not so much spirituality, is uh, the a title of the third class I teach called What is a Cure? Now, of course, we would have to establish, or maybe that too can be talked about, whether there is anything that has been ill and that needs to become, possibly, healthy. Um, when, at the opening of, of the class, uh, I read with my students a very wonderful text by Georges Canguiem that is asking, is a pedagogy of healing possible? And in that context, Canguiem does ask a question whether cure is a return to some previous state or an entirely new and unknown condition, a result of transformation where neither the patient nor, quote unquote, the doctor know necessarily what will emerge. I would say that is one line that maybe um, can serve as a potential for, for conversation. Uh, another another um, line that comes out of it, rather in a straight uh, way, is are we all obliged to be well? Especially, are we all obliged to be equally well? I would say that Theaster's work interrogates that position too. Because in fact, it turns a belief, and I use belief here very specifically, that we may have how the other knows more about us than we know about ourselves. I think that there is something, there is a gesture, insistent, repeating itself gesture that the Aster makes to return question of believing to the subject, that is, to the other, while thinking about it himself, if not all the time, then often enough to have it sustained and always present. Let me stop here. I can return. Maybe switch my papers. You can just. Hi, I'm Tony Whitfield, and I um, also had the pleasure of spending a few days in uh, Chicago with the Astor um, in February. And um, I will get to what I think the connection was and how it, the personal connection. Um, I think I want to do something that uh, my co-panelists really haven't done, which is to speak um, off the cuff and really personally about um, the Astor's work and what it means to me right now. Um, I called Shannon this weekend, or we had a conversation this weekend in which I was panicked. And I said, um, in fact, I think I wrote, I don't really know anything about belief or spirituality, and why am I being asked that? Is it because I'm black? <laughs> and I think that that's fair enough, and I think I probably was, to a certain extent, asked to talk about that. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Um, 
And then I realized that there were some things that actually I did have. There were questions that I had that were rooted in, um, rooted in something that was very nebulous, sat outside of the critical um, language that was being used in all of the articles that are in the resource documents. And um, were really personal to me as another black man of who's older than he is <laughs> and just as handsome uh, <laughs> and I um, realized that you know as an artist I was feeling for him and I was feeling what this um, moment and process and trajectory and being thrown up and up and up in a world that he gave, uh, seemed to give a, um, some credence to that I, uh, I was questioning, um, the, to be in culture. Well, we're all in culture. Um, and I think for me that was part of, part of the, the thing that was part of my skepticism about what, in fact, I was seeing, what I was understanding, what the experience was of Theaster and his work. Then I, after talking, and act actually going through the work last night, I was again thinking, um, I suddenly had a realization. Oh, Tony, you spent all from Thursday until Sunday night at a gay men's, no, a queer men's retreat upstate run by former theologians who have set up um, this space in which queer men get to largely talk about what it means to get old. Um, or older, I was young there. And, um, and the total focus of the weekend, which we spent sometimes without clothing, sometimes with, some, I won't even go into the details, was <laughs> power, pleasure, and play. And I thought, oh, yes, you do know about the belief piece, and you do know about the spirituality piece, and you also know what it is that draws you to Theaster's work and draws you to his experience and the, the, his presence in the art world at this particular moment, because if anything is pre if any things are present in the career that he's um, in the middle of, it's power, pleasure, and play. Um, for me, one of the things, I, I, uh, one of the questions, I'm gonna, I have a lot of questions, and I'm gonna read the questions to you that I have about the Astor's work, and in some cases, I will tell you a little bit about why I'm asking these questions, and in some cases, I won't. Um, The first and big framing question I have is, in the role that Theaster is playing, and I love the way we're talking about him as Theaster, as and using his first name as though he's almost Madonna, um, <laughs> and that he's, we have this kind of relationship to him that I think is really kind of a curious one culturally, okay? Because we're also, we've spent a lot of time talking about his work, but the reality is that he has become a phenomenon. And that that phenomenon, in some ways, is as important as the actual artifacts of the activity here. And it's being dealt with, we better believe it, by those people who are making it possible for him to move forward and continue to produce this work as a phenomenon that they are buying into and they are buying 
the aster as much as they're buying the work that he does, okay? It goes along with the territory of being in these bodies that he and I occupy in this world. And I don't think we should ignore that. The one question that I had was, how does one walk the line between being a shepherd and a charlatan in that role? How do you actually recognize what it is that you can possibly do, achieve, what you can get, how you can bring in the resources that others can't bring in in order to realize things, what the, what the, what the price of that actually is to you as a creative person. And then what's your role in relationship to those people with whom you are doing this thing? Do you become the shepherd? What the art world and culture asks for is the auteur. And I'm gonna to try to avoid using words like that because they frankly don't interest me a whole lot. Um, being the maker being the agent, being the person who does these things, being the leader, being the one who the check is written to, okay? How do you then become the shepherd and play the role where in fact you're leading, you're taking people forward, you're also, you're also protecting them you're doing the other thing that shepherds do. You watch the flock. You make sure the wolves don't come in. You actually um, handle everything. How do you do that within this context in which time is also in play? Where in fact the, the, the finite nature of your human body and the fact that you are at your prime is really, really recognized. That people are moving you forward because you've got the energy, you can perform well, you may present a good show, you're bright, you're everything that they want, okay? Theaster talked a lot about, when we were in, um, in Chicago, about, he said frequently, what I really want to do is make heat. Okay, am I right? I actually did a little work, a little piece, which I'll have to send you. It's been on my, on my blog for a long time to prove that I didn't just make it up. And it says, it's for Theaster Gates, and it says, does the desire to make heat, is the desire to make heat about burning down the house? I think that's what it said. I thought a lot about it, and I, there are things that I want to also add. Is it the master's house we're burning down? Are we burning down our own houses? Okay, what is that fire? What does that mean? All of these things for me, sat in that spiritual belief realm of what, was drive, what drives forward the work here. Um, someone earlier said, fight fire with fire. I don't know. I don't know whether you fight fire with fire. Um, I think you do it sometimes. I think we're given the tools. I think the aster has the tools to fight fire with fire. Um, I think there's a belief that he would fight fire with fire, and that helps move things forward. I think the other thing, that one of the things that has become really interesting to me here in terms of understand, watching a kind of transformation, because in the work that is um, in the resource guide, what's fascinating to me is that it really does trace the speed and the trajectory of this career. And it does give a real sense of how quickly things are changing for him. 
thinking about the Dorchester project and staying in place. I'm completely from a, a, a spiritual place. I didn't even think I really had one. Um, I'm f I feel the, a pull that says, how do you stay in place? How do you stay in place when, in fact, you are given, when suddenly you have the largest um, the largest commission, public art commission that the city of Chicago's ever had, okay? Um, how do you do that? And how do you, sta how do you stay responsible to, and what is your responsibility? I think it goes beyond simply, and this is what I hope the Aster will, will get a sense of over these days, is the degree to which trying to pull back and remain an artist and remain the maker and remain in oneself and understanding how in fact you have an impact on um, how your creative practice actually has an impact on um, groups of people but not wanting to, to play that community maker role how, how do you do that? How do you do that and survive? And how do you actually bring to that, um, what values do you bring to that? And what is this, you know, to what extent is it a stra is that strategy, is that distance a strategy? The artistic distance a strategy? Um, I was also, there are two things that also, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll wrap up, two things that um, I also found very moving and really important. And um, one has to do with the continual attachment to clay and clay in one's veins. Um, how fundamental it is, how you go keep going back to it, how that material is really important how it's your material, how in fact I don't feel that with a lot of the materials that you actually use, that there's somebody else's materials, that you've relegated the use and the, and, um, the, the expertise to other people, that, um, and that in that, and understanding that you've done that, what I found really moving was the shift in your thinking away from the object to the making, that making the, uh, the way to make is a fascinating way and it's a place where in fact the power, the pleasure, and the play can happen authentically. I don't think we've said anything about authenticity up until this point. I don't know that anybody ever will. It's really a dicey area. But, I'm, but I, think it's, I think it does exist. And I think that there is a striving toward that that I do see in your work. And that excites me. And the process and the struggle to actually keep that going in great success is the thing that I'm taking away from this process. Thank you. Show your show yourself. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I didn't wear this. It's because, accidental. Yeah, it was just because I went to wear black today. So, but um, yeah, I guess this is more of a reflection with a few questions tossed in. Uh, so, being from Baltimore, I'm from Baltimore, and uh, I came to New York City. I guess two years ago, and 
reflecting back on it and going back and then coming back to New York City, that's, it's been a challenge in a way where I guess I have friends that feel disconnected with Baltimore and they're from Baltimore because of this transformation, this, this I guess, this bettering that's better Baltimore. And I think my, I, my question is for I, the mayor of Baltimore and for the community and for you guys, what does it mean to better? Uh, does it mean, you know, having John Hopkins take over, I guess, a lack of better word, the ghetto, and to like uh, better that situation, to move, you know, families from the city and move them out into like the county and taking this culture away from the land and just putting it in another territory, territory and then having John Hopkins just maybe build an extension on their university or having just an, another lab, but like what does that mean? Does it mean to better when we have like, you know, this amazing harbor where Michael Phelps just bought maybe like a $1.5 million house? Is that what we wanna showcase for Baltimore? Is that what better means, you know? That I, I think that's the question that I'm facing also, when you have the community in Baltimore, you know, telling you, like, you, you know, you're talented, leave Baltimore, there's nothing here for you. Go somewhere else, take your talent somewhere else, you'll do better, you know? There's this, this constant conflict of people saying what is better for Baltimore, and I think that's just the problem that I, I have with it. Thanks for the comments. Um, I think I'll start since I'm also the Baltimore person. Um, but you're raising like a really important question about gentrification really is what you're talking about. And um, this, this the, the work we're looking at here of Theaster Gates, it's not at all about gentrification. It's about living and staying, right? So, um, living and staying, and but also altering and maybe being inspired by m making it better, but not through a generic vision of what is gonna be a better Baltimore, which is like Inner Harbor and neoliberal blah dee -dee blah right? So I, I think that, I think it would be good to see if you can detach um, uh, projects for change and even the notion of, of better from gentrification and sort of large-scale government organized projects. I mean, I don't think you want to rule out government, and I, you know, and I don't think you even want to rule out any source of money that you can kind of try to deploy, and it seems to me that's what the Dorchester projects try to do, is like an alternative to the kind of um, urban renewal that you're describing, yeah. And there's lots of that going on in Baltimore too, right? Well, maybe just think smaller. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I don't think small is, is, is unpowerful. You know, small, yeah. If I may uh, yeah. respond, I thank you very much for your comment, but I would take the last line of what you have said. Um, that is, you have been told that you are very talented and that therefore it is better for you to leave Baltimore. I think that there can be, uh, you know, that we can have a conversation about who organizes these locations of what is hopeful <laughs> and where the hope lies. Yeah. And just as uh, Dorchester Project is really a statement, a reputation to accept what somebody else deemed hopeful. abandonable, 
you know, the one can make a counter statement and obviously an enormous energy and uh, that mind is a muscle and belief is a muscle is necessary to produce the counter statement. But I think that there is something where we can really ask uh, um, uh, theaster in this context of belief and spirituality and that is about the location of hope. Can, you I, know? Ask, can I respond to that? Um, I'm glad this hope issue came up. Actually, um, I went out of my apartment from the back, the, from the back of the building, and I walked over the su subway tracks the, that are outside, and there's a fence on either side of the street, and woven into the fence, it says, "Hope less, do more." And I think that there's something in that. That in fact, um, the notion of betterment is in your hands. Do it. Do what you, you, def you define it. You move forward, okay? I think that if there's anything you, that you learn from Theaster, it's this. I don't believe that gentr this is not about gentrification because I, don't th I think the gentrification is virtually inevitable when you do these kinds of projects. They follow you. It's about the world that you live in. Um, whether you want that or not, whether that's your goal, whether you abdicate a responsibility as, an, uh, as a gentrifier. Um, when I moved into, uh, into my apartment on Franklin Avenue and having grown, having grown up on, on Eastern Parkway in Franklin, having grown up in a slum in Philadelphia, and I walked down the street I thought, oh my God, you've moved back into the slums. What I was not recognizing was the fact that I was there. And by my very presence, it was the signal that that neighborhood had been gentrified. And, you know, I think that it's not as easy as to say, um, I am not a gentrifier, or I do good work, or I make things better because you don't do it alone. Thank you, Brock. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can remember um, 95, 90, there was a time before Johns Hopkins was interested in the land around it, when <clears throat> folk that lived in and around the school could buy a building for $1,000 or $1,500 or a buck from the city, the city didn't know what to do with its land. It was, it was like, it's like that moment, you know, it's that moment when everything is asleep or seemingly dead and the world just says, it's dead, right? And so for, for our aunts and sisters and uncles who were strung out because that, that war with drugs um, that was inspired by something other than black folk who don't make crack. Mm. Um, that however that thing played out, that there was a killing, a deafening, a deadening. Um, like, what do we do with these niggas? We, we kill them, and if that doesn't work, we'll let them kill each other. Right? And so in that moment, my boy James Merritt, we were in undergrad. I was a planner. He was a business major. He was like, bro, I'm going back to Baltimore. I was like, are you out of your freaking mind? Right, because it was before anything jumped off, right? And it was like, James was like, nah, man, I could buy a, a, a Hampton Inn for $100,000. I could buy a Hampton Inn from some Indians for $100,000, right? And he bought it. He, he bought a hotel. He bought his building, then the next building. These are, these are now, James was a businessman. His black brother, light skins, handsome, rotund. You know, he was like, he could like go in, but it was like also John Hopkins was able to figure out, that, and now I want to talk about universities and large institutions and their capacity to get another kind of resource that not only in the spirit, say NYU, you know, the new school, you know, Columbia, Penn, Howard, Harvard, they all live around Yale, they all live around Negroes. And so they can say to the federal government, Hey, listen. We want to. We want to be a great. We want to be a great neighbor. We want to. We want to help the people 
who have not been helped by our histories. Uh, we believe that, now really they're talking about an expansion of their university, but we, we want to help, you know. And, and their, their strategic planners are saying, oh my God, Micah is going to grow by another 50,000 students in the next five years. Yeah. Micah's like, well, you know, we, we really want to do what we can to, you know, make a, more, a, a better place for us all, right? And that turns into millions, if not billions of dollars. And, and, and it's like, so, so what does better look like? One version of better looks like um, you eradicate the thing, you know, Mies van der Rohe style, like modern, modern movement style. You say, you know, so better, th that's one better. And it's the kind of better that's like better per square foot. So I have to say, man, you know, if we could get these 12 blocks, we restore these what we, It'll require some change, which means we're going to have to move out the Negroes. It'll, you know, we'll tear down everything that's here, you know, in this new construction. It's like there are all these opportunities for a developer, for, for John, somebody to put some pressure on Johns Hopkins and say, um, we demand some, a community benefits agreement that says that in addition to the thing that you build for your students, you got to build all these other things there. But then there, there is this issue of leadership where like if John Hopkins is speaking to itself and there's no other power speaking at that thing and, and, and you know, where there was a particular kind of black and brown and yellow leadership and now all of that leadership is isolated in, in universities, it imagines itself more theoretical than practical. There's nobody speaking to power saying, you're gonna have to do some shit here. And, it, and it's like, and when it doesn't, black men and women who live in those places become violent. They rob little white kids. They take their iPads. They take their iPhones. They rape them. They're like violent acts happen because there's no other form of kind of strategic leadership, but there's a need to rebel. There's a need to the point of burning down your own shit, right? That, that, that there's a kind of a, a directionless violence that wells up because we don't know what else to do against the machine except to, 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 to you know, to eventually uh, want to be like it, to, to be a part of it. You know, so we, we end up going to Columbia. And it's like, yeah, I used to live down the street, and now, now that mansion is, a, is, a, is a, the center for the, right? So I say go back to Baltimore, you know? And, 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 and if that makes sense, and that going away from Baltimore and going back doesn't hurt. W.E.B. Du Bois never went back. You know, he never went back, but the, but the impactfulness he was able to have as a result of the message of a humble narrative, a humble beginning was really important. So whether you go back or not is a personal decision, but there's a way in which your Baltimore-ness, uh, that, that thing could continue to have substantial impact. 